and a friend are looking for a place to live. You have a list of places and go to see a rental agent to check on a number of points. Listen to the conversation between your friend and the rental agent and complete the list. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, we've been looking over your listing of apartments for rent and we have a few questions about a couple of the apartments. Can you help us? Sure. Yep, yeah, this is our most recent listing. What would you like to know? Well, we were first wondering about the house on 3rd Street. We can see that it is furnished and rents for $135 a week, but can you tell us how many bedrooms it has? Let's see. In addition to the den, it has three bedrooms. What about the one on Route 9N? It looks like it's big with a library and a deck, but it doesn't say how much it costs or anything else about it. Oh yes, Mrs Gaylor's apartment. That one is actually only a 10-month rental and it is going for $156 per week. It's quite a nice place. She only rents for 10 months each year because of horse racing season. Then her relatives all come to stay, so tenants have to move out. It's a little bit inconvenient, but past tenants have really enjoyed their stay there. Oh, well, we need it for a full year. I guess that one is out. How about the rental on Broen Drive? How many rooms does that one have? As it says on the list, it has two bedrooms and a private kitchen and bath. But it's actually a very small place. That's why it's a bit cheaper. Oh. Well, then, what about the one that has three large rooms? Who is renting that property? That one is a good deal. Mr John Smith is renting it. But he's quite eccentric and he has a strict rule about no pets. How about cats? Nope. Absolutely no pets. Hmm. Well then, how about this studio apartment rented by Mr Bo Jensen? How is that one? That ad is actually a bit deceptive. The studio apartment is the whole upper floor of an older house. It's actually very large and, at $45 a week, quite affordable. And it's near campus. I think I'd like to check that one out. Do you have a telephone number that we can call? It's not on the list. Oh, it isn't. Here it is. You should ring area code 518 and then 543-7790. Thanks. I think I'll call on that one first. Your friend decides that he would like to talk to Mr. Bo Jensen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Hello? 1512, Route 9. Yes. Is this Mr Jensen? Yes, it is. Can I help you? Yeah. We're studying here at university and we came across the rental information for the studio apartment that you are renting. Is it still available? Yes, of course. I actually just placed the ad and you're the first person to call. Is there anything you'd like to know about it? Yes, actually there is. As students, we are on the internet a lot, and we heard that some homes in the area have high-speed connections. What type of connection do you have there now? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting first question. But I guess I have heard that too. But we just have a phone line here. Nothing fancy. I think you can have a cable line installed, but it's just a phone line for now. OK. Well, maybe we can do that. What type of heating does the apartment have? Now there's a more traditional question. We have oil heat here. It's an older house. 
That tends to be a little more expensive during the winter, right? Yeah, but there's nothing to do about it. It would cost too much for me to put in a gas heater. What else would you like to know about the apartment? Well, we heard it was quite big. Is it furnished? Actually, yes. I should have put that in the ad. It has an old couch and a couple chairs, a dining table, refrigerator, stove, and even a dishwasher. Does it have any beds? Yep, it has two. That sounds great. When is the apartment available? You can have it tomorrow night if you want. I just have to clean up a couple things before you get here. Do you want to come over and see it first? No, it sounds fine to us. I actually know the street too, so I know the area. We'll take it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Two. You are going to hear a talk given by an international student. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. As an international student coming from Sierra Leone, it gives me great honor to give these opening remarks and welcome you all to Ashisi University, where excellence is the code. I believe I speak on behalf of my fellow colleagues when I say we feel that we are the most fortunate and privileged university students in Ghana. You may ask, what is the basis of such a conclusion? And I will simply say to you, in which other tertiary institution in Ghana do you find the same level of IT infrastructure and facilities available to students? Where also do you find such a low ratio of students to lecturers and computers? In which other educational institution do you find 55% of students on some sort of financial aid who in addition enjoy services and benefits such as job placement after graduation, on-campus employment that pays above the minimum wage, a supply of textbooks, and access to online databases. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no other institution of higher education in Ghana today that matches the learning environment and the quality of instruction at Ashisi. I could continue listing reasons why we students feel this way, but I only have five minutes for this speech. Believe me, I could go on for hours. At Ashisi, everyone is considered a leader and is treated special. Ashisi equips us with the necessary determination, strength, and belief in ourselves to be able to achieve our goals. We are being taught to think outside the box and to question and challenge our assumptions about the world we live in. This, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the benefits of a liberal arts education, which seeks to broaden our intellectual capacity. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. At Ashisi, we are also exposed to real-life situations and learn how to deal with them through a practical and vigorous academic program, as well as various seminars in which prominent leaders in their professions are invited as guests to interact and share their knowledge and experiences. Some people, 
even some of you in this audience, may believe that tuition at Ashisi is too high, but I say to you that the students here are unanimous in saying it is worth it. Not because we all come from well-to-do families, but because when it comes to one's education, you need to aim at getting the best from the right place. One's education defines who you are and what your perception of life and society will become. Ashisi offers us a top-quality education which meets high international standards. This is due to the strong linkages the school has established with three of the very best schools in the United States, namely Swarthmore College, which is ranked as the best liberal arts school in the U.S., UC Berkeley, and the University of Washington. In addition, Ashisi has recruited an excellent faculty consisting of lecturers from various countries, including Ghana, the U.K., and the United States. These lecturers are among the best in their respective academic fields. I believe this is the school's greatest asset, a strong and knowledgeable team dedicated to achieving successful results from their students and who also love their job. I would like to end with a personal message. My fellow students, because we are among the most privileged in our society, we should take responsibility for our own destinies, make our parents proud, and create a legacy for those that follow us and Africa as a whole. We must give back to our society after completing school and achieving our goals in life, which I believe we all can, if we properly utilize our time and take advantage of all that is offered here at Ashisi. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Peter Walsh being interviewed for a job. Listen and choose the correct answer for each question. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Joanne! Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin, and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well... Where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end, because it's right up at the northern end of Australia, and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists, People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia. Probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realize until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art, music, dancing, and so on are concerned, because it's so remote. 
I mean, we don't really get things like theater and opera in the same way as cities down in the south, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves. Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artist groups and writers groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international. Yeah, they say there are over seventy different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over one hundred years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in eighteen eighty-seven, but、mm, when a very bad storm,、uh, a cyclone, in fact, hit Darwin in the nineteen seventies, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious center today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see the places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year, it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places. But believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it, even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. And, and answer the questions. Please sit down, Mr. Walsh. My name's Jane Swain, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello. How do you do? Now this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to chat about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Westons? It is Westons, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I am not sure. Let's see. I left university in two thousand five. Is that right? Yes, two thousand five. Then I was unemployed for about three months, and then I traveled round America for a few months. So yes. It must be about three years now, in fact. Hmm. Yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change jobs? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting and stimulating. The salary's okay, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted. So that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh, my dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. The other people are great. There's a good cooperative atmosphere. I mean, among the staff, and compared to other companies, the conditions are great. I mean, the office itself and the working conditions. Hmm. And then there's the fact that they give me lots of room for initiative, and let me make decisions. You know, 
That's what I really like most about the job. Yes, well, we're looking for someone like that. You know, someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. And what about your education? You went to Manchester University, didn't you?、Uh, yes. After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design, but I decided to give it up and did an arts degree at university instead. Good. And have you done any courses since? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a type of fundraising for business called crowdfunding. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Today we are continuing our look at funding opportunities for small startup businesses. The emergence of social media has given companies the ability to connect with fans and potential customers directly. On the back of the growth in social media. A model of raising finance has emerged, known as crowdfunding. This revolutionary way of raising finance began with micro lending in the 90s. More recently, an equity-based model has emerged that allows people to invest directly in a new company. We're going to examine this in more detail later, but let's turn first to a third model, which I'll term a fan-based model. With this model of crowdfunding. Individuals are encouraged to give an amount of money to support the launch of a project or initiative without the promise of any financial return. Instead, there's a reward for donating. This contrasts with the micro lending model, which would require a return on investment, and the equity-based scheme, which may offer shares. Crowdfunding portals or websites allow the business concerned. To present the initiative along with the financial target required, there's a fixed time limit for fundraising, and if the target amount is reached, all donations are paid to the company or individual. Whether it's an author planning to write a new book, an independent film company looking to make a new film, or a technology company with an idea for an app, the person or company needing funding would turn to its fan base for support. This is managed through one of the many crowdfunding online portals that have emerged. Of course, a fan or supporter of a particular initiative is likely to give money anyway. But donation-based crowdfunding will often make donating even more attractive by offering a rewards-based incentive scheme. Let's take a film company, for example, that needs funding for a new film. For a small set donation. The donor might be offered a free ticket to the premiere or a DVD of the film. A larger set donation might be rewarded by the chance to attend a launch event when the film goes live. Those people who make bigger donations could even be offered the chance to meet the cast of the film, whilst the highest level donation could see the person's name mentioned in the film credits.
For companies that already have a significant fan base, crowdfunding offers a fantastic opportunity to raise money quickly from a large number of people, each of whom donates just a small amount of money. Compare this to the time and effort that would be needed to sell your idea to investors or your bank manager, particularly in an age when raising finance can be difficult. The company may also have links with partner companies or organizations that run fundraising events. In this case, you can significantly increase participation by working with these organizations to promote your crowdfunding project. Another significant advantage is that you can reach out to your fan base for feedback on the project while it's being developed, thus making the final product more appealing. Crowdfunding enables you to raise awareness of the product at an early stage, thus increasing the potential for sales. With so many people behind you, it can also act as a great incentive to get the best possible product out on time and on budget. However, there are disadvantages to bear in mind. The model can be described as all or nothing. If you don't reach the monetary target required in the agreed time, all promises of donations are cancelled and no money is paid, leaving you back at square one. Should this happen, or still worse, you receive the funding but are unable to come up with the product, not only will your fans end up disappointed, but the portal will record the fact that you failed to reach your target or that the initiative failed. Fulfilling all the pledges that you've made to people can also be very time-consuming. For example, remembering to send out copies of books or free cinema tickets can sometimes be forgotten in the excitement and frenzy of launching your product. People sometimes forget to factor in the cost of rewards when calculating profit margins. But these can be significant. And finally, if you have a small fan base, for example, you're a new company or have a small social media footprint, raising awareness of your initiative will be challenging. These drawbacks aside, donation-based crowdfunding is a wonderful opportunity for individuals or small startups to raise funds for that exciting new project whilst reaching out and connecting to the people who are most likely to support and promote your work for you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.